We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Dr. Stephen Lieb, founder of Lieb Capital Management and the author of China's Rise and the New Age of Gold. How are you today, Dr. Lieb? I am fine, Tom. And please, Steve, <laughs> no one calls Dr. Lieb except my wife when she's angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I try to be I try to be a little bit formal, but we'll we'll use Steve from here. Um, so, you know, I thought we could kind of base today's discussion around an acronym that um, you you put in a recent article. That's the acronym of ICAG. So, what does it stand for, and why is it important as we look out over our our future, over let's say the the medium to to long term here? Well, it, it's important to realize that. We've reached a point of inflection in America and I think the entire globe. And I think the acronym uh, inflation, commodities and gold really reflect a, 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 a foundational aspect to this change and this uh, point of inflection. In this country, we have basically spent the last. Oh, I can remember in 1982 when the market took off. Uh, since then, till very recently, uh, we've been in what I think a lot of people would have called the golden age of uh, certainly a golden age of financial assets. That's over. And that's part one of what that acronym means. Uh, going forward, our task is going to be and I'm, when I say our, I'm no longer talking about just the United States. I'm talking about the entire world. The entire world is going to have to focus on the uh, distribution of uh, resources. I mean, resources are going to play an ever more important role in our lives. Uh, they're going to become scarcer and uh, they're going to become one reason for that scarcity is going to be an increase in demand, not in the wealthy countries in the world, but uh, in the uh, maybe 70 percent or so that are not wealthy mm -hmm. and some that are outright poor. And by poor, I mean, you know, living on a dollar or two a day that are, you know, feel blessed if they can get a square meal during a day and forget about square to get, you know, some nutrition during a day. That's a massive task. And it basically ha ha has come about because of, you know, I, I don't want to say evil, but the, the, the fact that we've, in this country, and you really have to look to the United States first as to why we've gotten into this quandary, why these major inequalities exist in the world, not only within the US, but perhaps even more important between the United States and the poor countries of the world, the very poor countries. Um, China until recently was a very poor country or a lot of it was. I mean, and whatever you may think of China, some people hate it, I, I, I respect that. Uh, but they took about, they took more than half a billion, half a billion people out of dire poverty. We, we, we have to do that with the rest of the world in order to get along as a human civilization. And in order to do that, we're going to face a lot more inflation than we've had in the past. Commodity prices are likely to go up. Uh, and this is going to sound strange, but gold is going to have to play a much more important role in how we govern ourselves. Um, the problem with the world, as I see it, and the problem with this country, because I know this country a lot better than I know the world, and you know, I'm not a historian, but if you go back to just Read the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. That's one thing I would like everyone to read. Uh, it's really, it's, you know, it's remarkable two paragraphs. 
And there are several points that are made in that paragraph, in those two paragraphs that have really come to stand out for me. And one is this whole notion of equality that Jefferson speaks about. The other is a notion of a creator. And he doesn't specify what that creator is, whether it's a Jewish creator, whether it's a Christian creator, whether it's a, a Muslim creator, whether, you know, it's, it's your own creator. You know, that equality and this notion of the creator were, were, were things that I believe we carried with us by and large, for nearly 200 years. Um, we, we, we had some major hiccups, namely the Civil War, but what country gets to a civil war and on the other side of it finds the same sorts of principles still lurking? I mean, a, a, a belief in the sacred, by and large, I'm not talking about the entire country, and a notion of equality that wasn't, you know, maybe widely shared uh, because there were African-American people. And I think basically, you know, the fact that they that they were different, they weren't necessarily in no way were they in the sense that Jefferson meant equality. What let, let, let me just say this. What I believe Jefferson meant, and I think it's pretty clear. In fact, these are his own words. By equality, he means freedom of thought and respect for freedom of thought. And if you can have a, a society that basically respects everyone's freedom of thought and have a government that is dedicated to preserving freedom of thought, you have something that is really good and is going to succeed. And we did succeed as a country, not completely, but we were possibly on our way in 1970, uh, by the 70s, or certainly by the 60s, we were on our way. In fact, Black people in the 50s and 60s in this country, they, they lived all right, and they had made it on their own. Um, they, were, they, they were basically a lot of successful Black people, and they weren't regarded as hey, there's a black that's successful. They were regarded as successful people. I mean, Sidney Poitier, I mean, yeah, he was black, but he was a wonderful actor. And that sort of feeling that, you know, people were free, they had their own ideas about how things worked and that material uh, um, things were important. And in a capitalistic society, yeah, people should be rewarded. And it made sense. And I think everybody accepted that, that if you were, you know, very good at, at managing a whole bunch, thousands and thousands of people, that was, you know, you should be rewarded. But at the same time, when, you know, I came of age in the 60s and 70s, you know, I remember my grandfather saying to me, you know, America is wonderful because basically everybody can afford the essentials of life. And if you can afford the essentials of life, I mean, that's what a government is for, in my opinion, to provide and make sure that everyone has the essentials of life. And um, if you have that, then I think you have the makings of a very good country. Um, and you can let people you know, people will be richer than other people in terms of material things, but materiality cannot define what you mean by equality because no one's equal in, in, in material aspects. People are taller or shorter. People are good at this. People are good at that. Uh, you know, we have IQ tests today and, and, and measurements today. Well, all those measurements were created by people, by, by white men that lived in a capitalistic society. It was Stanford Binet test. That's the mother of the college boards, all the, you know, testing that you do today. I mean, what you know, nothing makes that sacred. It's just that, you know, we, we had adopted a capitalistic system and OK, fine, it works, but it, it's not the way to measure people. I mean, measure people not in terms of how much money they are, are, don't measure them at all. I mean, you know, accept them as equal, but people that have a lot of money are not necessarily going to be happier than people that 
you know, live a, you know, a decent life without a lot of money. I mean, they can be very happy because they feel the happiness within themselves. And I know I'm sort of talking like uh, um, some sort of religious nut. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who wasn't rela- raised in religious background at all. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I think the people that are that, that have most influenced the way I think really didn't believe in formal religion because they felt that formal poli- religion was too infused with the political and they wanted something totally separate from the political. I mean, Tolstoy, for example, had a copy of the Bible. In fact, he wrote a book called the gospels, uh, you know, not according to Tolstoy, but Tol- Tolstoy's view of uh the Gospels and no reference to magic, no reference to the miraculous, no reference to Jesus turning water into wine, no reference to the crucifixion or the resurrection. He wanted the moral teachings to stand out and he wanted everybody to believe in those moral teachings in their own way. And because we don't understand, I mean, Tom, among other things that we have to recognize in this life of ours is that it, America now is almost a completely material society. We, we worship in a way money and we worship material things. Science is a material thing. In science, if you define the color blue, for example, you're talking about different wavelengths. You're talking about, you know, all sorts of phenomena that you see on machines. And that's what blue is. If you read and tell, let's say, someone who who has been sightless, this is what blue is. It's this combination of wavelengths, et cetera. And they go out, they're going to see blue, but it's not going to, they're not going to know it's blue. They're going to know it's something that's affecting them in a very unique way. And that's what you cannot describe. You can describe a lot of material things, but what makes people equal is what they see when they see blue. We all see something different. It's very difficult to explain. I mean, it's meant to be, I think, difficult to explain. But what's happened now is the material is 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 coming together, and it you know there's a certain price we have to pay. I mean, it's ironic. We are going to eventually run out of resources. Uh, I don't want to get into the argument about climate change, etc. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, well, I'll just tell you my opinion. I think that a lot of this, uh, I can't say it's false, but I think that a lot of what we read about climate change and, and how imminent it is, is because it serves material interests. People are getting rich following uh, climate change. Uh, it, that's very, very dangerous because it could interfere with what the, a real problem is, is that we're going to end up without the energy, the food, uh, and everything else that we need to survive as a human species. That's why I call this a real point of inflection. And the only and, way- And maybe without a plan to be able to, you know, get through some tough times um, with the food and the energy transition, let's say, that we're, that, you know, everybody wants to make. I don't, I don't think there's a good argument for- you know, anybody that, that is, that wants to pollute the planet or, or burn a hell of a lot more fossil fuels or anything like that. But there isn't, I I think there, there needs to also be a a reasonable plan to how we get to these new, new places. That's exactly right. And what made America great, what made America great, you're, you're, you, you, you are exactly right. You've said it more succinctly than I can, than, 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 than I could. But that, that really is the crux of it. We have to develop sustainable energies and, and sustainable food sources. And we're not going to do that by forcing, by focusing just on the material. We're going to have to focus on coming together as people and really working all on the same page. We may dislike the Chinese government and dislike the way they do things. We may despise Russia. Uh, but you know, I don't want to get into a talk, uh, into a discussion about Russia and Ukraine, because it's just horrifying what we're doing there. And it's all material. It's all about, in, in, in the end, 
we would love to have Russia's resources. They're the most resource rich country in the world, but we're not going to get there. And the Ukrainian war is proving that. And, you know, what you hear on mainstream media is, you know, just assaulting us with the material, why it's important to support Ukraine. Why is it important to support Ukraine? How many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians have died? And for what reason did they die? You know, why is it important to support Western Ukraine in particular, where they have statues of, of people that were extremely sympathetic to, is, uh, to Hitler? It's like the country's done a 180 degree turn. We fought Hitler in the Second World War. Now we're supporting him. OK, I mean, that, that's that, that basically you, you, you can find out for yourself. But w- what you have to start believing and start focusing on all of us, it, uh, it, especially on this in this country, because I think we've drifted more away from it than any other country is that it's important to be on the ship and to have the oars all pointing in the same direction. Tom, all today's modern technology were cre- was created in this country when the U.S. was a great country. The transistor, uh, uh, superconductivity, the laser. The last time we landed on the moon was a project of uh, the President Kennedy. We, we haven't done very much since then. Um, I wrote a book in 1999 really talking about this. I mean, I talked about, you know, how foolish the uh, whole boom and the uh, tech revolution, uh, the tech stock boom was. I mean, I was a finance, I still am a financial advisor. But um, coming out in the last two or three years have been articles that that were credible in nature, which is still considered uh, one of the top uh, science magazines in the world, and also the American Economic uh, Research, I think the the top the top economics journal. The name skips my mind. Both refer to how much disruptive technology has slowed down. No more disruptive technology. I mean, the only thing we've done basically since 2000 is that we have made, I mean, probably the most important thing that we've done is we've made it possible to cram more transistors into an area than ever before. Problem is, it doesn't do us that much good. It Moore's Law, which was really as I interpret it, was making things faster and getting more things done. That was very important, but we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. We have transistors that, you know, we have our circuits that basically now can do more things, but they can't run faster. So that basically you can duplicate these circuits possibly with less energy. They use tremendous amounts of energy. You've read about GPT-3, the, the artificial intelligence uh, um, you know, chat box. Well, it's ridiculous for a lot of reasons. It's, it's not anywhere close to human. It'll never be creative, et cetera. But just talking about the here and now and what the world needs, it consumes massive amounts of energy and basically will reply to questions in a way that is consistent with the current narrative. It'll tell you that Ukraine is a good place, probably if you asked it, because it's fed, it's still what whatever it's taught on is what it's going to repeat to you. It, it's not real. It, it, it doesn't represent any progress in, original in well-being. Original thought, exactly the word, no creativity. And so, Steve, let me, you know, let me by- interrupt you for a sec, if, if I can here. You made this distinction sure. earlier and you're also, you know, recently here, you, you were talking about the idea that we haven't really done a whole lot since, let's say, the space age. What is it about the 1970s that you think is, is you know, responsible for this change? Th- th- thanks for asking that question. Yes, because I it, it, this is going to sound very odd to people at first. But what happened to America in 1970-71? Well, first, you, you, you saw the glimmerings of inflation because of Vietnam. And Vietnam became uh, was a war. We, I think almost everybody admits we never should have fought. 
Both Kennedys opposed it. Uh, when JFK was assassinated, uh, a thousand that two months after he was assassinated, I don't know whether they carried out on it, but the plan was to have a thousand of the advisors that were there uh, come home. RFK was assassinated, uh, and his major belief was that he wanted to get out of Vietnam as soon as possible. I, I personally think he would have won the election, but you know, no one can say that. What happened in 1970 was a punctuation of what you saw, the material creeping up, our wanting to conquer Vietnam, our wanting to conquer the world, our wanting uh, all these material goods basically uh, sort of replaced the fact that America treated everyone equally or more or less equally. I mean, they respected everyone's belief. And what made that possible, and I know this sounds wacky, but I have a lot of evidence for it. What made that possible was our gold standard. What our gold standard did, and it's ironic because gold itself is money. It's always been money. For 5,000 years, you could treat gold as money. But gold had some other quality to it. And you, you, you could call it beauty, but... It, you know, it has some other magical, almost magical qualities. You, you, you can uh, 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 hammer gold down to where it's as thin as a wave of light. You, I mean, it's probably not even visible, but you won't harm it. It's not destructible. You can dissolve gold in a material, in, in, in an acid, and then uh, follow a process and completely recover that gold. The French, I think, did that during the Second World War because uh, certain uh, athletes had won gold medals and they didn't want the Nazis to seize those gold medals. So they dissolved them and no one saw them. And after the war was over, the gold was still in that solution and they were able to recover the gold completely. Gold has a ma sort of a magic substance to it, a magic aspect to it almost. And it's also, and this is the key thing, even more important is, than these material properties, although certainly equal, is that it's also a sacred metal. It's beautiful by nature. Probably the most religious person that lived in the 20th century was someone named Simone Weil. Uh, she died at 33 because she was helping uh, fight Franco in the war. And during that period, she refused to eat anything other than rations that were given to the soldiers that were fighting. And she was a sickly woman. She was small, et cetera. And she passed away in a hospital. She was as religious as you could possibly be, though she did not belong to a church. I mean, she didn't believe in churches because she, she thought they could be too influenced by the political. But even Simone Weil, made the comment that gold was beautiful and that when gold left the French monetary system, all of a sudden people that wanted to accumulate money only wanted to do it for power and to be, you know, have power over other people. And that meant to her treating other people as cogs and machines. Gold, because it sort of marries this sacred aspect of human beings, just like Jefferson believed, and material things is suited. The only thing that's really suited for a monetary system, it almost has to be the basis of a monetary system. And that's what we're coming to today. I mean, I believe in the world is going to succeed and survive, literally survive. We're going to have to manage to, 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 to transition to sustainable energies not because of climate change, not because of anything else, but because it's only through sustainable energies and sustainable food supplies that we're going to be able to sustain ourselves as a human species. Without food and energy today, we're gone. I mean, it's only a matter of time before there'll be wars, there'll be, you name it. I mean, we're almost in one now because we know in this country we don't have enough energy. And I think that's probably why we're fighting the Russians. 
that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. It doesn't make any sense from any long term perspective to be fighting the Russians. And this is not complimenting Putin. I mean, I think Putin is is a monster in certain ways. And I think there are certain, certain very good things about him. Same thing with Xi. I mean, in China and the same thing with the Chinese. They're, they're terrible. I can understand not getting along with with you know, China and, and certain Chinese people. But on the other hand, there's something sacred about them. They believe in family, et cetera. You know, a very interesting thing that I read uh, uh, recently, I was doing research on the Milgram experiments. I think that's what basically has convinced me or did a long time ago. I think it, this is just coming out after what, 50 or 60 years of hibernation within me. Um, they were talking about the Milgram experiments, which basically say that uh, it's very easy to get people to obey authority. Very, very easy. And they were having a discussion. Well, is it easier in, in do, you, do you think that the uh, Asians would be, you know, wouldn't they be much more susceptible to uh, the Milgram experiments and, you know, this tendency to obey than the Westerners? Well, all the evidence I've seen is the opposite. In fact, uh, the Indians uh, are, you know, it's almost impossible to get them to obey. And, and I remember the question was poised and there's not a lot of research on it. I mean, th there is research on the Indians, but, the, you know, not, not, not extensive. But the question was poised uh, on one of these uh, uh, um, blog sort of uh, pages like uh, I think stack or whatever they call it. And everybody, you know, answered, you know, the fellow was asking the question, you know, in the same way, certainly the Asians would, you know, because of their authoritarian society, et cetera, they're going to be much more amenable to obeying. So will the Russians. Well, somebody raised their hand and raised their hand. They had a comment that didn't agree. It was American, you know, what you could tell, uh, you know, strong U.S. citizen, wasn't really trying to prove a point, but he said, I spent 10 years living in Russia. And I didn't see this at all. What I saw was a bunch of people that had tremendous loyalty to their family. And at the same time, didn't really care what other people said. I mean, that's what I think Jefferson meant by sacred. And that's what Jefferson meant by equality. When he spoke those words in, in you know, in the Declaration of Independence, they were all endowed with uh, uh, of, uh, right to pursue happiness, right to life, et cetera. And those things are sacred things. They're not things that make us better or worse than anyone else. No one is better or worse than anyone else. We're equal. And yes, we again, I'm repeating myself, but people can make more money than other people. If you live in a capitalistic society, that's fine. In, in other societies, there'll be people that govern you. And basically, the purpose of government, the purpose of democracy, uh, in, in Jefferson's words, were basically to provide a uh, 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 society in which respect like that could exist in spite of material differences that might exist among people. There was still an underlying respect for everybody. Everybody was equal, even though somebody might be a lot richer than someone else. We've lost that. We have completely lost that. In our minds today, we are much better than the Chinese. We are much better than the Russians. We are much better than a lot of other people. And some, you know, I think these neocons that are, you know, get the blame for a lot of this. And I, you know, I'm not trying to go into that. I'm not trying to say that they're bad people, but, you know, they, you know, believe we're better than everybody and it should be our way or the highway. That is exactly the wrong recipe what the, for what this world needs. We need this belief in equality and that we're all going to row the boat in the same way. And that is the only way we're going to get through this. That is the way America established its own greatness, not by believing that Rockefeller was better than somebody else, but by believing Rockefeller may have given us energy. And, you know, that was a great thing. 
I don't think Rockefeller necessarily believed he was better than anyone else, despite all these conspiracies you read about the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds today. I mean, I think that that's nonsense. I mean, he basically felt that what he was contributing to the society was, you know, great. And he may have felt very, very good about that. I don't think he felt very good because he was so rich. I think he felt very good because he was able to help other people. And I think when you look at someone like Elon Musk, who basically doesn't appeal to me that much, I'll be honest with you. I think he's kind of like a nut in a way. I mean, smoking marijuana and things like this. But on the other hand, you have to, I, I, I think that he means well. He, he wants us to be a great country. He wants us to explore space. What philanthropist has ever spent $44 billion to basically create something that he believes is essential for America to be America and to be, get back to where it was in the uh, pre-70s era when, you know, when we were on gold. He, he, um, he spent this on Twitter and he wants it to be a free a, spe a place of free speech where the propaganda is gone. And I think, you know, you could probably convince them that, you know, free speech is a first step in, you know, believing in equality and rowing the ship in the same way. Everybody on the ship. That's what we need to do. Steve, do you think that, you know, when we talk about all this, you know, the, the different aspects of the BRICS, the let's say they're the intermediate steps that they have, um, how far along they might be to to possibly having a, a, an alternative to the U.S. dollar, a different reserve currency. Do you think that the U.S. would be better off to, you know, in some ways become an ally to the BRICS nations? Totally. And this is what they want. I mean, in the BRICS, China, you know, everybody in the U.S. will tell you that China is going to rule. No, it doesn't make any sense for China to say that. Why? Because it's Russia that has the resources. China may have the manufacturing capabilities, and we have our own capabilities here. There was there would be nothing that China would love more. And in fact, Russia, well, they're going to have to get over, you know, this horror we imposed on, on them. And we really did. I mean, we, we goaded Russia into this war. We gave them no choice in the sense that, you know, we felt that we had no choice when Russia put missiles in Cuba. Russia felt they had no choice when Biden refused to even hear of, you know, not accepting Ukraine and NATO, which would have put, you know, missiles all around Russia. But the point is, China can't accept themselves as superior to Russia. Russia has all these resources and the African countries have all these resources. We're going to need everybody in this world. And I think we would be so much better off, Tom, if we would go along. It doesn't mean that we have to give up anything that we believe as sacred. I mean, you know, what we believe in this country as sacred, I, I'm not sure anymore. I, I, I once knew, I once had some sense of it. No one exactly knows because, you know, one of the things is consciousness is a total mystery. We have no idea what makes consciousness, which is, you know, in, in itself an argument for a higher power of some sort, which in itself is an argument that we should get together. We're equal. In, in the important ways of life, we're equal. It doesn't mean that a guy like you can't beat up a guy like me. You could do it in five seconds. But, but in terms of what we believe, your beliefs are not better than mine. I mean, I think you're a very good person. I hope you believe I'm a good person. But, um, it, it, you know, in that sense, we're, we're equal, but, but we're good in different ways. And we're good in ways that can't even be explained. And this is a hard nut to swallow. I mean, I may sound crazy to people. I don't think I am. But, you know, when it comes down to brass tacks, yes, I think we should go along with the BRICS. They, you know, and that one common denominator that all BRIC countries share is gold. Gold has to be part of the monetary system. And this is not as, as, uh, you know, I, I sort of uh, ha have great respect for Charlie Munger. <coughs> but on the other hand, he gets it so wrong when he refers to gold as a barbaric relic. He I mean, and 
I, I believe in, in a sense, he's kind of a contradiction in terms because I believe he's a pretty good guy. I believe he wants to educate people and help people, et cetera. But in, in a sense, he's a creature of, you know, material success. And he, he's looking at that. And, you know, if gold becomes a standard, material success like his probably will not be possible. That's that, that's all right. But it may be. I mean, you know, Rockefeller, I think, in real dollars was as, as successful as Buffett and some of the richest today. But um, it's going to be different. Success is going to be measured on our ability as a human species to come together. And nothing is more important. I mean, really, it's the difference between whether we have progeny in this world that can thrive or whether the world is just goes to pieces. Where all these resources that Russia and the African countries have that we're going to be desperate for sooner rather than later, they go to waste. And we don't succeed in developing these renewable technologies that we're going to rely. In my opinion, fusion is probably more important than solar. But, if you know, I, I, I could be convinced that otherwise. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I want everybody to be on the same page, pulling those oars in the same direction. That's really what I want to see. As you talk about, you know, this this othering that we've seen in the world, you know, making somebody the enemy. How do you think that the war in Ukraine has changed Russia and China's relationship? I think it's made them closer and to see each other as, as different. They're never going to see each other as the same. They have completely different societies. I mean, Russia, believe it or not, has elections. Uh, Putin, people that say these terrible things about Putin should read how he talks to uh, the Russian people, which you can get on uh, uh, Kremlin.org, and they'll give you an English translation. He's not saying this for American consumption. You have to work hard to get it. Uh, and you have to work hard to get any truth in this country today. It's that horrible. Uh, uh, but I think that this Russia is a completely different society than China. Totally different. They're Western. They're we're part of Europe. China is not part of Europe. And China has their own culture, uh, Confucianism, that goes back 5,000 years. They're totally different than Russia. But I think this war has brought them together. And if it can bring Russia and China together, I mean, remember, there was a time during the Cold War where they were bitter, bitter enemies. And that was much easier to understand than this togetherness because they're totally different cultures. Yet they can recognize that within each of the culture, there is sort of respect for everyone else. And that's what's important. So they've come together in terms of, I think, just respecting that they're, that, that they're, you know, equal in a way and that they each offer different kinds of things. And I think we've done that in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, I mean, you know, that's a, if there's anything good, it might have been bringing Russia and China together. And if there's anything major about it, and I believe there is, I'm, I'm a big, big optimist on this, Tom. I believe there is a chance we will join and become one world nation. I know that sounds utopian, uh, quixotic, et cetera. But if it's quixotic, it's the only solution that I can see. Maybe someone much smarter than I am sees a better solution to it. But we've got to come together. We've got to make innovation, you know, for the sake of the betterment of humanity, not for the sake of, 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 of triumphing over other people. I mean, back in the 50s, when the Russians, who were our enemies, launched Sputnik, we didn't seek to ban Sputnik. We didn't seek to ban their, their capabilities in space. We, succeed, we, 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 we sought to develop our own and do it much better but because we thought we could, because we thought that, you know, what we held as sacred was, was better than what they held. We believed in Jeffersonian democracy. That, if, In a word, if you want to know that I'm not pre preaching heresy, what I am preaching right now are the two first paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. The only way I can find to meaningfully understand these two paragraphs 
is in terms of exactly what I'm saying today. And if you look closely at those two paragraphs, you'll see, I think it's the first paragraph, you'll see that Jefferson wasn't arguing that we were gonna break away from the British to become a better country than the British. No, he said, we have a right to be equal to the British. And that right to be equal, again, doesn't stem from material equality, doesn't stem from anything like that, but we have the right to our own freedom of thought. That's where it relies on, something that you really can't define materially, but it can result in tremendous material accomplishments. What you can't define material is absolutely essential for achieving the material accomplishments that we seek. I'm saying the world must come together and accept the fact that people are different and people can be different and still good in their own way. And I believe that is true for most of the people in, on, on this planet, not for everybody, there are certainly people that it does not apply to. But I think that when it comes to Putin and the head of China, it does apply. I mean, they are in their own way good. Russian people today, really, they they, they, have, they, they love Putin. They have a 70% approval. He has a 70% approval rating. And the major criticism, and this is from people that I know that are part of Russia, the major criticisms against Putin is that they want him to be tougher, if anything, on the Ukrainians. But he doesn't want to. I mean, he wants to, you know, he doesn't want to destroy. I mean, I, yes, he's, I'm sure he's done horrible, horrible things. I don't want to try and make Putin a saint. Far from it. Nor is Xi Jinping a saint. But nor are there, you know, these crazy uh, jails in, uh, in, in uh, the, the, this northwestern province of China that, you know, tortures Muslims. They had 31 Muslim countries uh, 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 visit China. And all of them saw how they lived and uh, they all had no problem with it. Why do you think that's showing up at the SCO and, and, and uh, the BRICS right now? Why is Saudi Arabia there? Because they convinced themselves that China is not a, some sort of evil enterpriser. Again, and repeating, they're a country that took half a billion people out of abject poverty, maybe more. Maybe it was 700 million. I don't remember the name. We can get along with people like this. We don't have to accept their way of governing. We can still govern in, in a democracy, but a real democracy, the kind of democracy that existed before 1970, not the kind of democracy that exists today, which is not a democracy. It's, a, it's some sort of corporatocracy. It's sort of some sort of a, a, a rule by the rich ruled by the rich corporations that control the media that, you know, instill in you that Putin is a bad man, he's horrible, that she is horrible, that China is, is, is the devil, that it, it, it's just not the case. We have to get rid of that kind of democracy. We didn't have it during the 70s when we were fighting, I mean, during the 60s when we were fighting a Cold War, we accepted Russia. When, again, repeating myself, when Sputnik came along, we didn't say we've got to blackball Russia. No, if we're, so if we're a good country, a real democracy, and, and can pull oars in the same way, let's do it. Uh, this is from the original Bible. Uh, written in Greek, Greek uh, I think from the uh, uh, book of Timothy. And I wasn't raised a Christian. It's, I, all this I've learned uh, uh, fairly recently. And, and, and the, uh, the actual translation is the love of money is the source of all evil. And that is, it, it's important to realize it's not money that's the source of all evil. Money is okay. I mean, again, you know, when we were a great democracy, a lot of people were richer than other people. That was fine. But the love of money is the source of all evil. And that's what, ironically, gold is able to cure. Because gold is, it, it doesn't represent the love of money. It represents money without the love of. Because it's what you love about gold, what people really love about gold is its beauty. And there's no way of defining beauty. Beauty is something different for everybody. No one, like no one can describe their pain in complete 
this. No one just can describe what, you know, the color blue is. They can give you the scientific definition, but that is not blue. People can, you know, have money, but as long as it's not love of money, once you have that love of money, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It's just the, the you use, what word did you use? Uh, you used, I think, a word that is more accessible than when I, we were talking uh, before. The, it wasn't lust. It was, uh, well, the biblical word is love, but I think you had a word that people could relate to a little easier. I wish I could yeah, remember, I remember exactly what it was now. <laughs> I've been wearing you out with coveting, all my stuff. Coveting money, <laughs> coveting money. That's the coveting of money, right? Yes, it, it, you know, is you know, is is a, is a good word too, it, but it's not money. How much money you have? I mean, it's, you can covet money if you're a poor person, and that's bad. I mean, it's if you're a rich person like Elon Musk or, or Rockefeller, the first John Rockefeller. I, I don't believe Musk loves money or covets money per se. I think he he wants money for the sake of bringing the world together, if you will, or for creating a civilization that can explore space. That's what he wants. He wants to land on Mars. That's what he that that's that's what's sacred to Musk. I mean, I can't define it in, in his words because there's no way to. Only he can define it. But from what you can see and how the man speaks, he doesn't speak as a neocon who doesn't have nearly as much money as Musk, but loves in a way or covets money and power. And it, it, it's you know that which we have that we were there. We were there 50 years ago. That's not such a long time ago. We can get back there, but we've got to uproot a lot of stuff. This is another thing that Jefferson said. He said, once democracy goes off track, he never expected it to last as long as it did. He, he says it's going to be hard to get it back on track again. You're going to have to uproot a lot of things. And yes, we have a lot of work ahead of us and pro probably a lot of turmoil. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but if we make ourselves our minds up, I think that's one thing that is sacred about most about most Americans or was sacred was a determination, an inward determination to make this a great country. When we were in a depression, it was an inward determination to, you know, to, to get us out, to find things that would get us out. In fact, a lot of the greatest inventions that we have today, you know, were well, they were created in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s and, and also during the depression. People were working together to get us out. Uh, and, and, and to make life better. And that's always been a characteristic of the kind of Jeffersonian democracy that you can find. And again, I repeat this. If you want to think I'm crazy, so is Jefferson. I'm in very good company, in my yeah. opinion. And I'll, I'll take that any day. He say, if you say I'm crazy, read the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. You don't have to read the speeches or anything else like I've done. Just read those paragraphs and think about them. Think about them really deeply, as deeply as you can. They're not hard to understand. Anybody, I, I believe 99 or 99.5 percent of the people in this country can, can easily come to grips with those paragraphs and realize that you cannot find, define equality in terms of material things. Equality is something inward. And the enemy of that kind of equality is that freedom of thought is this kind of love of money, which imposes power, it imposes thoughts on you that doesn't allow you to be free. And that's what we've become. We've become a country of cogs in a machine that was created without our permission. And that's a shame. It's, it's one of the great tragedies in the history of humankind, what happened to the United States. And if we can get back on track again, ironically, there is where we would have a chance to lead again, not because of we, we win a war or lose a war or whatever, but by cooperating and becoming one of many because we'll keep what is sacred to us. No one can take that from us. The Russians can't take that. The Chinese cannot take what's sacred to America. They really can't. And 
you know, but it will give us a chance to express that again. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know, without, without sacrificing anything, we could find a way to work together to share resources, to share information and, and energy sources, everything like that. But, you know, I think what it boils down to energies, all of those, all of those ideas require a lot more nuanced conversation than, than most people are willing to have. And I hope, I hope that, you know, a lot of my audience is, is able to, you know, entertain conversations like that, to be able to be exposed to new ideas that, that might be uncomfortable to be able to see the other side. Well, well, let me again, just repeat what I said, because it just came to me is that if we want to be number one again, We're never going to be number one by fighting wars. That should be obvious after 20 years of wars. We didn't make it. I don't know that we've learned that lesson very well there, Steve. Well, (laughs) it it should be a lesson that we've learned. If we want to be number one, go back to what's always been sacred to Americans, that we care about one another and that we treat people equally in terms of everybody's entitled to their own freedom of thought. That kind of sacredness will ironically allow us to rise, to rise to, to heights that are that, that we've lost. We no longer have the right to say we're the most technologically advanced country in the world because we're not. It's China. Believe it or not, that's true. But if we want to get there, it will be by stopping the wars and cooperating which, with people that are completely, that have completely different cultures, but cultures that are not worse or better than ours mm-hmm. cultures that are different cooperate with them and that that that's the way and you know so i'm not saying anything that anyone else is not saying i'm not saying that we have to accept the fact that we have to forever play second fiddle to russia or china but i'm saying that we'll never play first fiddle going the way we're going we'll play first fiddle fiddle by going back to what's sacred to america and that will probably take us much further, but it's it's not going to be easy, Tom. Like you like you were saying, it's going to require. I mean, the neocons, the people that control the material levers in this country, they control an awful lot, and it doesn't. Unfortunately, the sacred is is fragile in a way. It's vulnerable to what these people are doing, uh, and it's it, it's a shame. They're turning us all into cogs in their own machine all into just non-human pieces, just material objects in their own machine. Mm -hmm. We've become material objects and that's a shame. And we can, you know, break it if enough like us, you know, are willing to, you know, fight for it. Stand up and understand it. Steve, I, I, I appreciate your time and, you know, sharing obviously what you're, what you're so passionate about with us here today. Of course, if any of our listeners want to see more of, Steve's work. He's available at lieb.net at liebphd and also you're the author lieb. of the, com. Lieb. Oh, lieb.com. <laughs> okay, lieb.com. And the the author of a Substack, Stephen liebphd.substack.com, right? Yes, I believe so. Someone else, you know, publishes <laughs> okay. that for me. I just do the research. <laughs> just do do the, you know, the writing and the research, but yes. Okay. Steve, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate the conversation. You too, Tom. I really appreciate a chance to, you know, express my thoughts and I hope they, I hope they have some effect. I really do. They, I, I may, I won't see them in my lifetime, but I hope they still hope they have some effect. I really do. Absolutely. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.